For this video, let's return to the telencephalon, or cerebrum, and check out some other important brain structures. The cerebrum is made up of three subregions. There's the cerebral cortex, which we just went over, that's all that gray matter in the four lobes. There's the basal ganglia, which is an internal brain structure that can't be seen from the surface of the brain. And finally, there's the limbic system, which is where we'll find our next brain structure, the hippocampus. The hippocampus is found in the temporal lobe, and we've already cut it out here, so to show you, I'm just going to remove part of the temporal lobe from the rest of the brain to expose the hippocampus. The hippocampus is this structure right here. The hippocampus is critical for declarative memory. Declarative memory is any kind of memory that you can describe with words. This could be definitions of words, or recall of episodic memories, or memories of events. Non-declarative memory, on the other hand, is memory for things such as muscle memory or classical conditioning, where I can make you fear a buzzer if I always associate it with a painful stimulus. Don't try the last one at home, by the way. Your subjects won't like you. Without the hippocampus, you can't make new declarative memories, but you can still recall old ones. This is important because people with damage to the hippocampus remember events prior to the damage just fine, but they don't remember anything after their hippocampus was damaged. Patient HM is a very famous example of this. He had his hippocampus surgically removed to reduce his severe epilepsy. After the surgery, he was really no different than before, but he could only hold things in his short-term memory, memory which we use to remember like what we're talking about in an ongoing conversation, for example. But he was unable to store new, long-term memories. It's this long-term storage and consolidation of memories which requires the hippocampus. The memories themselves are not stored in the hippocampus. They're stored throughout the brain in the cerebrum. So patient HM could still access his old memories, but in order to put new ones into cortex, he had to have his hippocampus. Another patient with hippocampal damage kept thinking he was waking up out of his coma every few minutes and would write in his diary that he was finally lucid and keep scratching out previous entries that were labeled just a few minutes earlier often accusing others of writing in his diary. The dentate gyrus of the hippocampal formation is another known area where neurogenesis exists. The hippocampus takes input from entorhinal cortex, a small six-layer area of cortex along the side of the hippocampus. The hippocampus sends its output to cerebral cortex via the fornix, which is this cluster of axons seen here. The hippocampus was named after the Latin word for seahorse, and you can certainly see the likeness here, especially if I expose sort of the, the tail of the hippocampus. It looks a bit more like a seahorse. The amygdala is a small cluster of neurons called a nucleus adjacent to the hippocampus. Unfortunately, we can't see it here. It's also part of the limbic system and works closely with the hippocampus. The amygdala is important for very primitive emotions, more complex emotions like disappointment, Uncertainty, hilarity, or nervousness are likely above the amygdala's level of functionality and are probably experienced somewhere in prefrontal cortex. The amygdala becomes most active when we experience extreme fear or pain and directly influences respiration and heart rate to initiate a fight or flight response. The amygdala sends data to the hippocampus to let it know that the current situation is very important and should be remembered in great detail so that if it ever is experienced again, we will know how to react. This is why you can often remember very sad or scary moments in your life with near-perfect clarity, while less important moments, like what you had for breakfast 10 days ago, aren't remembered as well, if at all. The basal ganglia is a very complex but primitive area of the brain. I say it's primitive because it was one of the first areas of the brain to evolve in animals. The basal ganglia handles lots of automated functions, and damage to it can render people motionless without motivation, as is seen with Parkinson's patients. The basal ganglia is important for many functions, including motor decisions and control, and habit and motor learning. The thalamus is like the gatekeeper of the senses. Every sense, except olfaction, goes through part of the thalamus. The thalamus receives heavy back-propagating input from the primary sensory cortices of these senses, and it's thought that this helps it serve as a sort of filter. When you go to sleep, the thalamus shuts down and prevents sensory input from passing on to the rest of the brain, keeping you asleep even when there are sensory stimuli that would otherwise wake you. Because olfaction doesn't go through the thalamus, you can still be affected by smells, 
In fact, if you study with a strong scent like lavender in your pocket, and then sleep with the same smell near you, your brain will consolidate the information you learned with that smell earlier in the day.